So we'll just summarize the case from last time, even though you guys remember. So we had Mr. M, who's a 62-year-old guy with ischemic cardiomyopathy from his coronary artery disease. He had two stents, or one stent placed in a two-vessel cabbage, uh, most recently in 2013, and chronic kidney disease. He presented to the ED short of breath, couldn't breathe, had weight gain of about 10 to 15 pounds over the past 10 days, and chest pain with exertion. And we uh, looked at his physical exam, and he just had basically a lot of fluid retaining in his body, right? And then his labs and imaging studies showed that um, his renal function was worsening, he, his liver enzymes were starting to rise, and he had lots of fluid in his lungs. We saw those x-rays. And then we saw his echo where his heart was barely beating at all. So he's currently admitted in the CCU. And your first question was to understand what these drugs do. So I, I put, put in the answers. Three, four, and five are fairly straightforward. So four is just a lipid drug for his cholesterol. Five is just for his diabetes, because good, good sugar control is essential for all these sick chronic disease patients. And uh, the third one is furosemide, which is a diuretic, which most of you got correctly, just helps uh, get rid of the extra water in patients with heart failure who retain water over time. And then the first one, aspirin, and the second one is uh, clopidogrel. And so that one is basically, we give every patient with coronary artery disease aspirin. The second drug also is an antiplatelet agent that helps thin the blood and prevents clotting. And we generally give it to patients who have um, suffered an acute stroke or an acute MI or have stents. So this guy had an MI last year, so you know he could be on it for that. He would have certainly been on it in 2011 when he had a stent place. For that time, you needed for like six to 12 months, depending on the situation. So that is why he was on those drugs. And the second set is actually the heart failure medications. I think a lot of you identified them as antihypertensives or diuretics, which is true. And I think someone posted on the discussion forum this very interesting question of this patient having high blood pressure for a very long time, but now he's coming in on all these meds, but has a really low blood pressure, right? And we made this guy really sick to the point he's not perfusing his organs. So he's actually in what we call a state of shock, right? And his shock stems from his heart. So it's cardiogenic shock. So this is his home meds. That's how we presented the case. So the home meds in this case, for example, beta blockers are used because they've been shown to improve morbidity and mortality in heart failure. And they're not necessarily to lower their blood pressure as much as it to keep their heart rate under control and to prevent bad remodeling changes from happening to the heart. Now you can only imagine if someone's heart is not pumping blood effectively and then you just make it beat a lot faster to increase cardiac output, they're not going to be able to they're not going to be able to pump effectively at all. If anything that's really bad for them and often patients whose heart gets dilated with a heart failure also get arrhythmias very often because their conductive tissue is not the same as it used to be, right? So beta block is essential for that kind of purpose. Same thing with enalapril. It's, used, it's basically helpful in preventing bad cardiovascular remodeling because the heart's going to try and adapt to heart failure in bad ways, and ACE inhibitors prevent those. Yeah. Yes, so in general, it protects the kidneys, but in state of shock, we generally don't give them ACE inhibitors right away. So technically, when a person is in cardiogenic shock, we wouldn't give them any of the set two medications tem temporarily, because they all, they're all good for chronic management of heart failure. So when this patient gets discharged, we're going to use them. But in the acute setting, we won't. So and spironolactone is an interesting one, because it's only used for very severe heart failure. So it's also a diuretic like furosemide. It works a little bit differently uh, on, on a different part of the nephron, on the loss uh, segment. but. Uh, it's only used for severe heart failure because it retains potassium. So if you give it to other people and they're not closely monitored, then it, they can die from high potassium, which causes arrhythmias, which we studied in one of the earlier lectures, why potassium is so important because it ma maintains your resting membrane potential in most electrical cells. So that's the main reason for this. I think all of you did a really good job. I think the green one was a little bit challenging because it's easy to find the antihypertensive uses of these drugs and not really the rationale why they're used in heart failure, which isn't generally to control blood pressure. Um, so the second one was, why are his kidneys failing? So we already know he has chronic kidney disease, and now his kidney is getting acutely worse, right, in a short period of time. So it's acute on chronic kidney failure. And that is oftentimes reversible to some extent. In sick patients like this, not all the way reversible. But the reason is because his heart's not pumping blood, and kidneys need blood. So basically, this is a response showing that the kidneys are not being perfused very well. And I gave you a hint by increasing his liver enzymes, which tell me that his liver is not getting enough blood either. So we, and shock is basically defined as a state when your end organs, which are liver, kidney, et cetera, don't get the blood that they need. And so this proves to us that the patient is in cardiogenic shock, right? 
And the third question was, what are you going to do to help him? So to help him breathe better, um, the first thing is the fluid is what's causing him to not breathe better. So we want to remove the fluid from his lungs. I think several of you suggested thoracentesis, which isn't really something that we can do for this patient because this fluid is in all these tiny alveoli everywhere in the lung. Thoracentesis is when you have a collection of fluid, oftentimes at the base of the lung, which we can just stick a needle in and just drain it out like a bunch of water. Right? But that is not the case in this guy. He's got fluid in all his alveoli, and we need something more systemic to drain that fluid out of his body. So usually we would do furosemide, like the one he was on, but we do either a continuous IV infusion or we would do IV boluses. So it's much stronger if you give it intravenously as opposed to giving it orally. So you would give the same doses two or three times a day by injection in his IV, or you'd actually start a continuous infusion of furosemide with every second getting a few drops of furosemide in his blood, and that'll really help him get rid of that fluid. And you'll probably put a urinary catheter in him so it just continuously drains fluid out. The other thing you can do if he's still very, very uncomfortable from a respiratory perspective is you can put him on a non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which a lot of you mentioned in your answer. So something like a BiPAP, which basically means it gives an extra force from the machine, which pushes open these alveoli that have been filled with water and kind of collapsing. And if that doesn't work, you just do what uh, Dr. Eisler was just telling us two minutes ago. You put an endotracheal tube and get an advanced airway because you have to protect his breathing some way. And if he can't breathe or can't handle it, then you need to support it. So those are the two things that you could do. The second thing is, um, what, what, what do we want to do to maintain adequate blood pressure? And I think it's kind of an interesting question. So he's in cardiogenic shock. He clearly has a very increased preload, right? So we kind of want to decrease that preload. Basically, we want that heart to get some of that blood out, right? And we also want the heart to increase in contractility. We didn't really go much into his afterload state because at this point, his arteries are what they are, and we're not going to try to reduce his afterload by giving him any uh, medications to reduce blood pressure because that's just going to make him sicker at this point, right? Because he's in shock. So in general, I think the you would try to increase his contractility, and oftentimes we do this, and we, do, we don't do this for every patient in heart failure exacerbation. Like, they could be a less sicker version of this patient whose blood pressure is fine, like 100 over 60, and he's doing okay in terms of end organ perfusion, in which case we would just do the diuretics and the furosemide to get the water off. But in this guy, because he's so sick, we might have to use inotropic agents, which basically help the heart contract better. And those would be like dopamine, dibutamine, or milrinone. And like, you don't have to know the mechanisms, but they're a little complex and we don't have time. So I'll skip the mechanisms of those. But these are some of the drugs you can also give using IV infusions, and that'll help the heart beat better uh, transiently. The last one was non-pharmacological interventions. I only mentioned the device-based stuff, but many of you guys also talked about like diet therapy, low-sodium diet, and everything, and that's really good. That's what we do outpatient as non-pharmacological, like good diet, good exercise. Uh, but in this case, because he's severely decompensated and end-stage heart failure, I don't think sodium restriction or water restriction alone is going to help him in the hospital. We'll obviously do that. Um, so some of the things are cardiac re resynchronization devices like pacemakers, defibrillators, depending on what the underlying rhythm issues are, because the heart's dilated, the, the electrical tissue isn't going to work so well. So you need those devices to be put in sometimes. And then assist devices, which you guys also mentioned in your uh, assignments, like left ventricular assist device, right ventricular assist devices, biventricular, which is both left and right. Artificial hearts are new now, and they're being implanted in increasing frequency. They're actually not that new. The first like couple of papers are in like, the 80s, which is really strange. Stanford just started doing them last year, though. Um, I think the original research was from Arizona somewhere. Uh, and then cardiac transplantation. So uh, this kind of brings in like, you know, our former vice president got a transplant, you know, and it was like controversial because he's 70 plus. And should we do it for ischemic cardiomyopathy? Should we not? Like that's a huge discussion that we can leave. And then for certain conditions which are systemic for younger patients, sometimes they need like heart and kidney or heart, liver, kidney. They're rare, but they're done. And uh, they're quite fascinating. Can take like up to a day in the OR to do triple organ transplants.